My name is Chris Garbosio. Uh, I'm a sound designer here at Skywalker Sound. And uh, I've been working here about 11 years. Uh, one of the things my job entails is to come up with new sounds. So when there's a new project, we get new movies coming in here all the time. Uh, especially nowadays, we have movies that have a lot more computer graphics in them that don't have any production sound. So the the, the the images that we get have no sound attached to them. So part of my job as a sound designer is to come up with sounds for those images. So in a case like for Peter Pan, Tinkerbell came in. Tinkerbell didn't have any sound. She was completely, she was shot as an as a actress and then uh, enhanced by ILM and moved around the theaters. So part of my job, like in that example, was to come up for a sound, for her talking, for her Ex emoting for her flying around uh, so that's that's the job of a sound designer is to come up with sounds uh, specific to a, a, a movie my background is uh, a lifelong interest in music and sound um, always was interested in in those in music and sound so I started out, I think, probably with the intention of uh, making a great album. I always thought uh, one of the things I loved was listening to music, and uh, as, as, as I started getting uh, more involved in the crafts um, and just growing up, I, was just, I thought that it would be a, a really interesting thing to be involved in making uh, a great album because it, it can really have a lot of impact on you. There's a lot of emotional content there. So uh, I started out thinking I might want to do something like that. So I, I, I went to school at San Francisco State. I took the uh, broadcast communication arts program there with an audio emphasis. Uh, and then I started doing internships while I was going to school there. Uh, internships at both music studios and uh, post-production facilities. And uh, what I f I, one of the things I realized was that making a great album doesn't just happen spontaneously. It's, I guess that was kind of my rom romantic ideal that there would be this group of, of musicians together and they'd make this incredible piece of music like that. Um, so that kind of threw me a little bit, I, I suppose. Uh, and then one of the things I noticed was that um, trying to find a job uh, and actually get paid for it was that my experience was that post-production uh, it was going to be easier to find a job that I could actually get paid to do instead of being given studio time in uh, in exchange for my work. So um, going to school, doing that, uh, I ended up at a place called Focused Audio in San Francisco and I worked on the Gumby animation series. One of the things they were doing was they made all these new Gumby uh, episodes that were new and fresh. Uh, and at a certain point, they decided uh, I was interning there, helping out. They were doing the sound for Gumby, and the somebody decided that they wanted since there was only a few episodes, why don't we take all the backlog of Gumbies and release them at the same time? So we'll have more to show. So they thought that was a good idea, and then they. Then they, after kind of listening and looking at them, they said, well, we should probably update these because the new ones are so vibrant and new looking and all new sound and these look kind of old and they sound kind of dated. Why don't we take all this, why don't we update all the sound for the old Gumbies? So I got hired on to do that. So that was my first experience uh, working in, in the field uh, was doing sound effects for, for Gumby. <laughs> so that was fun. I did that. Then, uh, so I took some time off school to do that. And then I went back to school to finish up. And once again, they have like a career fair. Uh, and one of, the, one of the places that was showing at the career fair was Lucasfilm. And I was 
blown away the first time I saw Star Wars. I was, I don't know how old I was at the time, but I was younger and uh, I watched it seven times or something like that. I was just kind of blown away by the, the, the sound and the visuals, just the combination of the visuals and the sound was very impressive to me. I thought it'd be something that I'd really like to kind of check into. Uh, and being that I was from the Bay Area, I figured this is the place to work. If, if I'm going to work anywhere, then Lucasfilm's the place. So uh, I got an intern through uh, San Francisco State there. Uh, and one of the things I was doing was they were, uh, they were developing a piece of software called Soundroid, Soundroid which was uh, going to be, uh, it's kind of the first step of digital editing and electronic uh, post-production. And since I kind of, having my experience on Gumby, I had some experience with what they were developing. I had actually worked on some systems that had something to do with what they were doing. So I was able to have some input that was valuable, and I, and I could crash the program pretty easily. <laughs> so uh, between those things, uh, I got hired on as a, as, a, as a tester. And then once we got the program to a certain point, we, they wanted to take the the program and put it in use on an actual production. So when George uh, came up with the concept of the Young Indiana Jones television series, they thought it would be a perfect fit to try this out on, on the TV series. So um, I got hired to kind of usher in this new program, this new way of working. Uh, and so from there, I was an assistant for a while, and then I got moved up to being a sound effects editor. I edited some dialogue. And then uh, after that was over, I just stayed in the business and steadily got work with different people and have been doing sound ever since. So I kind of took it from being a sound editor and then moved into sound design and moving into a little bit to mixing at this point as well. Generally, I'll look at magazines or the internet for, uh, since I use Pro Tools pretty much exclusively, I'm constantly looking at the different kinds of plugins and processing uh, that they have for the program and different samplers. So those are the main things I'm kind of concerned about. Um, I don't think that the, pl the different platforms, the way you edit changes that much. That's pretty straight ahead. But the tools and the interfaces, um, I try and I just try and play with them. A lot of them are available during with like a 15-day demo off of their websites, and I just um, try and stay abreast of what's been developed or what's new out, and uh, go and play with it for a little while and see if it's something that that's useful. I've worked on. Uh, well, the Young Indiana Jones series. I've worked on Star Wars Episode One, Star Wars Episode Two. I worked on Titanic, Pearl Harbor. Um, I've worked on Peter Pan, uh, Bandits, Hellboy. <laughs> uh, those are some of the some of the main ones I've worked on. Titan A.E. was another picture I worked on. Some of the tools that I use, are it, mainly it's Pro Tools, and then things, uh, the other big technology is portable recording. Um, so just keeping up with uh, having a good, stable, portable digital recorder that's a high quality um, recorder is a big one as well. A lot of it is is not only processing it, but going out and finding good sounds that, because processing can only take you so far, um, especially given whatever project you're working on. Uh, in, in my opinion, it, it's probably a little easier to process something totally into something that's interesting, but might end up ultimately not sound that organic. So a lot of it is actually going out and trying to find good organic sounds that that are interesting. So um, going out, setting up recordings with people, usually it's pretty specific to the project, 
but always kind of keeping an ear out for anything interesting and then going out and recording and then editing and then cleaning up the sound of the sounds and taking the bits and pieces that are more that are interesting um, ultimately I think the the job of a, of a sound designer is to find interesting sounds and use them in ways that might not have been anticipated uh, you, you find an interesting sound that maybe your friend's dog makes and then a squeak that somebody's refrigerator door makes um, and my son snoring sounds like a comic book that he just sounds completely ridiculous um, and you take all these little bits and pieces and you start cobbling them together to make something interesting and you can it's amazing once you within it when you have a visual image to, to take some of these things that are completely random and uh, a lot of times they'll work and that's kind of the, the most fun thing is is having these kind of unexpected victories um, of found sound and um, maybe even something that's kind of like you know my son snoring uh, and taking these things and making them work to to the visual that we're working to so uh, an, another uh, so the the tools are um, it, uh, it's a combination between technology and just using your aesthetic as a person it's amazing when you go out field recording then you really then you really start focusing on what you're hearing because ultimately you're trying to get something the one thing that you're trying to get so if you're out recording cars and you're out on a country road uh, if it's not a plane a distant plane by it's the birds are chirping crazy they're just you know you can't get the birds to shut up or yeah you know air traffic it's amazing just how much air traffic there is uh, you just kind of tune it out after a while as a pedestrian or just living in your house but when you're actually trying to record something you, you realize wow there's planes going over all the time uh, and and just traffic noise traffic rumble uh, it's hard to get isolated sounds uh, out out in the world if I'm recording a truck a lot of times I'll uh, like I did a cement truck for bandits there's a big breakout scene when this uh, it's a big Mack truck breaks out of the prison uh, they, they steal a truck and they go out so for something like that uh, myself and, an, and another person the person will be on the ground the street wherever we're recording it recorded it out here um, doing buys and distant turn maneuvers and then I was actually on board and then I realized that the best sound that the truck was making was coming out of the pipe the pipe was kinda high up and it gets a little dangerous it's kinda silly sometimes when we're recording that you can kinda put yourself in danger uh, without really realizing it at the time because you're kinda chasing the sound and then you get the sound and then you realize you're hanging off of a off of a exhaust pipe on a big semi truck uh, so you just a lot with with recording a lot of it is mic placement same kind of thing like in in the studio except that we're outside oftentimes and you just try and get the um, you just have them drive by a couple times and you you put your figure out where the best placement for the mic is which side of it and kind of go with it in that angle and just put your microphone in various places and find out what you get and you, you, since they're very uh, something like a truck is so loud that when you move it around it, it can create quite a difference you never know what you're gonna get so just record as much as you can which makes uh, so when you bring it back in uh, it's fairly time listening is a real-time activity so you can't really speed through it anyway um, that's one one thing they uh, you know people are always saying you can do things faster and you can but some things you can't listening is real time and it all, I think it always will be maybe they'll figure out something I don't know but uh, yeah going through listening to the sound uh, then finding the bits that are that are going to be useful and then given the application uh, whatever we're trying to accomplish uh, start processing it or just clean it up and then hand it over to the editors um, who will then take that and edit it to the, the picture so we'll try and do if we know we usually we, we make a spotting sheet we know that 
the truck goes by at 40 miles an hour. Uh, so then we try and get as many 40 mile an hour buys and then make them into files that the editor, editors can then cut. Uh, and then other times, like uh, I worked on a film called Punch Drunk Love. Uh, one of the things the director wanted me to do was to, there was a five note melody that was going to be in the score that was going to be kind of the signature for the, the character. It was actually going to kind of embody the character. So there was going to be little things throughout the film that would have this little five note melody. So one of the, th one of the main things he wanted me to do was uh, they're in this restaurant and they leave the restaurant and this big semi goes by them slowly, passes by the, the couple. Uh, and this was going to be the point which they're, they realize that their relationship is going to happen. And so the truck needed to make this five note melody. So one of the things I, I had from recording this cement truck was the hydraulic brakes make these kind of interesting squeaks and squawks and they almost have the singing quality to them. So I had all these various um, tonalities of these, these truck squeaks that, that the brakes make. So then what I did is I took the score, brought the score into Pro Tools, um, and then one of the tools that Pro Tools has is that um, it, the, it's a pitch shifter that does it in half semitone steps so that I could play, I would find the squawks that were most, most natural for each of the notes of the melody and then put, I'd take a squawk and put it against the first note in the melody and then I'd match it and then I just, so I'd make a loop of it playing back and over it and slowly change the pitch until it was the, the pitch of the first note. And then I take another piece from the squawk of the break and match the second note until I do all five five notes of the melody, and uh, so I process it that way. It made for an interesting uh, truck buy. Yeah. Generally, the first thing we want to do is to meet with the director and uh, get all his specific, his or her specific notes about what they want to try and accomplish in the soundtrack. Uh, so ultimately the director um, will, will kind of give the yay or nay to the sounds that I create. So uh, generally that's the way it works. So I'll, I'll, we'll get the notes, get the picture, start creating things, and then see how they work against it. And once we get to a point where I feel like this is working pretty well, you don't want to go so far into the process that if it doesn't work out and the director doesn't like the, the, the direction you've taken, that you haven't wasted all this time. So you try and get something, uh, uh, kind of sketch it out to where you think it's going to kind of present your, your, your idea, your concept. Play it back for the director and let the director make comments on that. Kind of go from there. As a sound designer, we're responsible for the sounds uh, throughout the whole film. Uh, sometimes there'll be specific jobs where it's just one or two things, but generally we're trying to create the soundtrack for the film. Um, so we'll, we go through the entire film and pick out the spots where, um, where we need sound design more than we need uh, the edi editorial side of things, where we just we edit together some of the, uh, the more uh, the stuff that we have in our library, which is ex very ex extensive. Uh, so each reel has its moments of where it needs sound design. So w one example, working with a director, uh, he, one of the things uh, I came up with a bunch of ideas. One of the ideas the director wanted me to work on was come up with kind of this sci-fi subtext. Like maybe the, as if the character might have been receiving transmissions, like these subtle transmissions from outer space. So I came up with a bunch of stuff like that and sent them off. And uh, he actually took some of those and edited them into places where probably most people um, in their right mind wouldn't have put in because they would have thought maybe that's kind of just too far out there. But it was kind of a great way to work, letting, you know, just giving a bunch of sounds to the director, letting the director um, 
find the sounds he liked and put them in the places where he wanted them, which most of the time you, you feel a little uh, maybe hesitant to go too far out there because um, a lot of times I don't want to get too crazy. The typical time to do sound design for a film, it runs anywhere, probably three months is about about typical. I don't always get that full amount of time. Usually, usually it'll start anywhere from around six weeks to eight weeks and then depending on how involved the project is, uh, maybe three months. Generally we don't get a whole lot more than that. It can be pretty, a lot of times we're, we're working pretty fast. There's not a lot of time to explore uh, certain avenues, which maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, I, I don't know. Um, certainly ex exploration is the big, the, the big time element. You can spend a lot of time with a sound that you might think suggests something that it might turn into this great sound. And, and it might be a great sound, but it might not be apl applicable to the, to the film you're working on, which then ultimately you've wasted a day on uh, something that is of no use at all. So kind of have to use some discretion, but you also don't want to kind of shut down that, the, the whole creative process of, of finding out what works and what doesn't work. One of the great attributes of Skywalker Sound is having a, a great library so that as a sound designer you don't have to come up with every single sound when you have a new project. So basically here at Skywalker we have uh, a whole library of sounds that anybody working uh, on a project has access to. It's, we have a full database that, that reflects everything that's constantly being updated with other shows that have already finished. Um, and it's searchable with keyword searches by, by the show, by the designer, um, lots of different ways that you can search and find the sounds that are uh, on a server that can be then downloaded to your personal machine and then edited. So that's a, a huge resource to have because we have so many great sounds available to, available to us at any time especially when you're in a situation when you're at the actual final mix and maybe something's not working out that great or the director has a new concept and he wants to try it. We have, you know, 80,000 sounds available to us um, that are searchable quite quickly and easily to get and downloadable at any, at, at any second. So it's, it's very powerful to have that. So I'm going to uh, access the database here at Skywalker Sound. These are all our various uh, servers. Some are specific shows and some are the effects libraries. And the program we use right now is called Panorama. And that allows us to uh, access the whole database. So as a keyword search, let's say I put in truck it searches and it comes back and it says that there's 2,526 out of 71,956 uh, so there's a lot of different things we one of the big things that we tried to that we established early on was the categories uh, and I think we have probably somewhere around 70 different categories and you can you can show this in any you can sort by source, category, effects name, description, or notes. You can use this to create a new spotting list and spotting note for a specific project. And then just to play it, you just double click on the sound and it plays back an air brake hiss from a truck. So let's say I wanted to go by a category I'd go into our category tree and go down, since I know it's vehicles, there's vehicles, um, mechanical, military, miscellaneous, tires, vehicles, trucks. So then that might um, narrow my search a little bit. That brings me down to 1610. And then you can search within this category tree. Or I can say, you know what, there's that great truck I used in Punch Drunk Love. Uh, let's go and do it by show. Click on this and 
I have all these various shows that we've worked on here at Skywalker. Uh, so I go to Punch Drunk Love, and then it'll show me just the sounds that were in that were created for Punch Drunk Love. So I can, by going down, looking at my category tree, I see that there's uh, vehicles, trucks, distant wind by. I can play that. And then you can just uh, move ahead. It tells you that it's, this file is 3 minutes and 31 seconds long. Who, who designed it, what sample and bit rate it's at. So that's, uh, that's kind of how our database works. Here's an open up a session in Pro Tools of some sounds that uh, we'll manipulate and try and figure out maybe what the source was and, and manipulate into a completely different sound. So that sound sounds kind of like a weird sci-fi loop. Now if I take off all the processing on it and then listen to it, It's a completely different sound. So by applying various types of processing, one being a resonating filter, two being a bandpass filter, another being a pitch program, then one more being reverb, takes it into a whole different thing. And then once you kind of get in there doing that, you can just start kind of playing with it. So you can see that you can change things pretty dramatically. Let's take uh, another example. At one of the things that will you start playing? First thing I did was I took a section of it, even though it looks like it's playing, I I've, I've took a section of it, and this is called the freeze program. So it's taking a snapshot of about a, a second and a half of the audio, and I'm telling which part of it to loop. So I'm either telling it to, to loop a very small section of it, or And then you can start playing with the pitch, bring it higher, bring it lower. Change the number of loops that's happening, two being the lowest. Bring it up to like anywhere up to 18, which makes for more consistent sound. 
And then if I apply a bandpass filter to it, this is going to take, take out frequencies. So right now it's only, since there's not a lot of low frequencies in the sound to begin with, we'll not hear much down in the lower register. Then we take it to the higher register, and it's only letting, letting through the high frequencies. You can just shift that. A lot of times what I'll do is, as I'm playing with this, I'll be re-recording it, and then go back and take sections of the tweaking of it that I like. Same thing with this uh, resonator. I can mix the amount of the, the effect in with it. And then this is a, another pitch program that also has uh, frequent, has modulation. The, the, the basis of it is pitch. This again, you can change the amount of direct signal and mix signal. So those are the, uh, some of the tools that we play with. It's a lot of tweaking. It's a lot of just kind of waving it around and finding, depending on what you're trying to do, um, finding a right tonality um, or not processing it and taking just the uh, cobbling together organic sounds and creating something that way. This console is a, it's a control surface for Pro Tools. It's called a Pro Controller. And it doesn't pass any audio through it. It's just a surface for controlling these knobs. It corresponds to the track name. This is Audio One, so this is also Audio One here. And you can see by moving this knob, it's controlling the volume. So if I want to go through here, um, you have to be in uh, writing automation. There's a read mode, there's touch mode, uh, auto write and trim like a, a normal console. But it allows me to Can control the volume, then I can go back and look at it graphically, what I just did, and then further tweak that um, to how I want the volume to be. So I can undo it, I can redo it, or I can go in and adjust each one of these nodes, they're called, by grabbing it and dipping it and adding more uh, and doing just about anything uh, to it to give you really uh, an incredible amount of uh, accuracy, especially when you're working the picture, you can find uh, the exact frame where something happens and then have one of these, not, these, these nodes and then affect it as you need it. If I was to give anybody advice uh, as to getting involved with, with sound uh, at this level, I would say that it helps to have a, a good natural qual uh, curiosity for sound, kind of the love of sound, hearing things that give you I an emotional response. I think that's, uh, I think we're, we, the culture we live in is mostly a visual culture. And um, sound is, you know, we only have five senses and sound is one of them and all the senses are very powerful. And if you just close your eyes for a little while, you'll, you'll, you'll understand how, how um, powerful sound can be. Um, so that's w certainly one way that to, to get started. And 
The other things you should uh, try and do is to find some way to record sounds. Doesn't when you first start. I don't think it needs to be anything that elaborate. Uh, a lot of people use mini discs with a decent microphone. That's a fairly affordable way to start. Just going out and recording things, even if at first you you think that you're just recording anything that seems normal. Maybe you go to a baseball game or or, or something. You might end up recording this amazing conversation between people or just recording your conversations that you have with your friends when you're hanging out. I used to do that. That's a lot of fun to kind of play back conversations after uh, even just been hanging around and having fun together. Uh, and then with the technology it's getting a lot more affordable. Um, you can get Pro Tools for free off of their website. Uh, you, so when you go and record something you can then make the files just like we do here. And, uh, and, and then start working with um, some of the tools, like getting a sampler, um, either a digital sampler or just a regular keyboard sampler. There's plenty out there. There's every year, or half a year, they come up with new products. So things are constantly being outdated and people, there's a lot of people who always have to have the latest tool. So there's lots of used um, items that are, that are quite good. Um, the software samplers that they have now are, are really great. It's all tied in with Pro Tools. And then getting these things and, and just playing around and just uh, having fun with sound. Getting, getting it to where you start playing with sounds that have an impact on you. That when you hear that sound, it, it tells you something. You react to it some way. Generally, it's a, for me, it's like kind of an emotional response. How does, how does that sound make me feel? Uh, does it make me feel kind of scared? Is it kind of a dark sound? Is it something that's happy? Does it make me feel like I want to relax and lay down and be on a beach? Uh, I think it's it, one of the things um, that, you, that helps become like a sound designer is to recognize a sound for the emotional impact that it can have. I think it's important to, to know how to use a computer well. I think it's the, we're now at a point in time that it's, it's a huge asset to know how to use that well. Um, and then start getting involved with, with projects on a small basis. You know, a lot of local filmmakers are looking for people, uh, student films, people, people who you can help out maybe for free to start or getting internships through your school. Just getting into the place, getting into a place where they're actually doing work that is completed and has deadlines um, and somewhere where you can show, you can express yourself and have a good time doing it. I think if you can find a school that, that helps you along, that's great. Uh, definitely anything that can help you it's hard, it definitely is a hard business to break into because there's not that many jobs, especially in an area like Northern California. Um, there's just not that many people making films up here. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, there's a lot more work going on. I think it's, it might be easier to break in in a place like that. It's important to, to meet people to actually go through the process. If you want to do sound for film, you need to do sound for film, whether it's a, a student film or not, you're going to learn something. And so you should always kind of look at it that way, that you're, you're constantly learning new things about how the process is done. A lot of people are shooting video now, so that's a different process than working to film. Uh, so there's all these different kind of things, and it's constantly evolving. There's different frame rates, there's different sample rates, there's different sync rates. All these things are changing all the time. So you have to kind of actually do it and then see your work on a screen in sync. Because <laughs> a lot of times, uh, those are like the, the little technical details that people sometimes don't pay attention to. And you get to the funnel and your stuff's not in sync. Well, that's a huge problem. So you have to go and do these things and, and do tests and learn. And, and I think going about it that way, you'll be able to uh, keep Keep one-upping yourself each time. One of the things you might also try is to take a visual 
um, and give it, uh, try applying a sound uh, with a certain emotion. So if, let's say, you might want to try and take a plate of donuts and give it suspense, find like a, an ominous rumbling tone, and then maybe have it transform into like a nice light chimey thing. Uh, so changing how you perceive the image by the sound. Uh, I think that's a would be an interesting way to kind of see how once you maybe come up with sounds that you've identified as certain emotions and then trying them against a visual that might not have anything to do with that sound at all and how it how it makes you perceive that visual. Take a film for that matter uh, and just take the the images and start coming up with your own sounds to it. Come up with a new T-Rex sound. <laughs> or, you know, one of the spaceships by the, X, the TIE Fighters or the X-Wing or whatever you want to do. Um, just how, I mean, it should be fun. It should be something that you feel like you're being creative in your work. If that's what you want to do, if you want to be creative, then be creative. And it's important to know that it's not always going to be, you might have come up with what you think is the best sound you ever came up with, but ultimately if the director doesn't like that sound, you have to learn how to deal with disappointment as well. And um, to not let it get in the way with your relationship with that person, because ultimately, like I say, it's about storytelling when you're doing sound for film. They don't like it, if they feel like it's getting in the way of their film, then that's part of learning to deal with the kind of disappointment of something that you might hold dear to your heart um, and you might not be using that sound. I really enjoy working here. It's, uh, it is, it's a fantastic studio. It's set up with a lot of great gear. There's a lot of great people who work here. And it's, yeah, it's still exciting. I mean, I've been here, I've worked at Skywalker for roughly 11 years, and I still like what I do. So I think that says a lot. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting to work on a lot of high profile projects. It's always a lot of anticipation, like when I was working on episode one, it had been, what, 20, 25 years since the last Star Wars? Uh, maybe not that long. I don't know what it was. But uh, it was a long time. There's a lot of anticipation uh, for that movie to come out. So that was fun to kind of be on the inside of this kind of big event. Um, and there's a lot of projects like that that have a lot of interest in the public and a lot of interesting projects just to work on just visually. It's challenging to come up with the concepts of, uh, of what something that doesn't really exist sounds like. Uh, so that's, uh, it's, it can be a, a bit daunting at times, but it's definitely challenging. It can be very satisfying when you, when you do finally come up with the, the right sounds after um, experimenting and, and working hard at, at what you do. You know, it's, uh, it's fun.